A History of the Episcopal Church by Robert Prichard. Chapter 1. Founding the Church in an Age of Fragmentation, 1585 to 1688. Early Colonization in America. Following a series of exploratory visits, Florida, 1565, California, 1579, Newfoundland, 1583, etc., the English made their first attempt at col American colonization at Roanoke Island, 1585-87. to They named the colony Virginia, after Elizabeth the Virgin Queen, 1558-1603, to though the island is in, is in what is now the state of North Carolina. The Roanoke, Roanoke effort was unsuccessful, but 22 years later, an English mercantile company, the London Company, did plant a permanent colony further north which is named Jamestown after James I, James VI of Scotland, who had followed Elizabeth to the English throne. Du during James's reign, 1603-25, to 25, this Virginia colony was the primary focus of English colonial efforts. It was not, however, the only English settlement. Navigation was still an inexact science in the 17th century, and not all the ships headed for the new colony reached their intended destination. In 1612, the wreck of a ship bound for Virginia led to the establishment of an English colony in Bermuda, a collection of islands 580 miles to the east of the coast of North Carolina. In 1620, the pilgrims also bound for Virginia landed at Plymouth, considerably to the north. In 1624, a group of English colonists reached Barbados. English Christianity and the Reformation. The colonists who came from England to America brought with them the religious faith of their native land. Like that of much of Northern Europe, the faith of the English people in the early 17th century was a Protestant Christianity that had been profoundly shaped during the 16th century Reformation. Colonists often disagreed about details, but the broad outlines of English Protestantism were clear enough. That English Protestantism was very different from the late medieval Catholicism that had been the faith of England at the start of the 16th century. English Christians at that time subscribed to a penitential theology according to which individuals made themselves acceptable to God with good works, pilgrimages, indulgences, and memorial celebrations of the Mass. Beginning in 1519, however, a group of theologians at Cambridge University began to question this theology. Had not the church gone astray, they asked, by limiting the love of God to those who could first perform good works? Did not the New Testament speak of a love that God gave to those who were still sinners? Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Were not good works a result rather than a cause of the love of God's forgiveness? At first only mild voices of protest, these early English Protestants, whose number included Thomas Bilney, around 1495 to 1531, Robert Barnes, 1495 to 1540, John Frith, circa 1503 to 33, William Tyndale, 1495 to 1536, Miles Coverdale, 1488 to 1568, Hugh Latimer, circa 1490 to 1555, and Richard Cox, circa 1500 to 81, made themselves increasingly heard. Bilney told of a sense of forgiveness he had found while reading 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Barnes warned that the pomp and ceremony of the church could obscure the simple meaning of the gospel. Frith rejected the popular depiction of the Eucharist as a re-sacrifice of the natural body of Christ that produced merit for those who paid the priest for the celebration. Tyndale and Coverdale worked on a translation of the Bible into English. The monarch at the time, Elizabeth the First, Elizabeth the First's father, King Henry the Eighth, fifteen o nine to forty seven, could not ignore the activities of the Cambridge Protestants. In the fifteen twenties and again in the fifteen forties, he persecuted them, but in the years in between, he turned to them for assistance. Henry chose two men with sympathy for the Cambridge Protestants: Cambridge graduate Thomas Cramner, fourteen eighty nine to fifteen fifty six and merchant Thomas Cromwell, circa 1485 to 1540, 
as his Archbishop of Canterbury and his secretary to the Royal Council. He chose one of the Cambridge Protestants, Hugh Latimer, as a bishop, and another, Richard Cox, as the tutor of his son, Edward VI. He approved the publication of an English Bible translated by two other members of the group, Tyndale and Coverdale. Henry never entirely trusted the Cambridge Protestants. They, for their part, reserved judgment about the king, accepting him as a possible instrument of reform without forgetting the dangers that political leaders could present for the church. In periods of cooperation, they were able to take the first rudimentary steps toward the reformation of the English church. They issued a Bible and a form of public prayer, the Great Litany in English, began to dissolve the monastic orders that, as the custodians of the primary relics and pilgrimage sites, were the strongest supporters of the medieval penitential system, and raised questions about the medieval doctrine of purgatory. The alliance proved only a temporary one. With Henry turning more conservative in the 1540s, yet the decade of cooperation gave the English Reformation a character that distinguished it from that on the continent. In Germany, Martin Luther moved within three years from mild criticism to total rejection of the Episcopal hierarchy of the Church. In England, in contrast, the circle of Protestants at Cambridge existed more or less openly for ten years, 1520 to 1530. While some ran more or less openly for ten years, from 1520 to 1530, while some ran afoul of the authorities or felt the need to flee to the continent, others were able to move into positions of authority. That they were able to do so gave the English Christians a sense that ma many continental Christians could not share, that reform and the church's Episcopal hierarchy need not be incompatible. The, reign, the reigns of Henry, Henry's children, Edward VI, 1547 to 1553, Mary I, 1553 to 58, and Elizabeth I, strengthened this perception for the English people. During the short reign of Edward, the Cambridge men quickened the rate of reform. They prepared two editions of the Book of Common Prayer, 1549 and 1552, published a series of sermons for use in English churches, the homilies, introduced legislation to allow for clerical marriage, and drafted a statement of faith, Edward's 42 articles, which would form the basis for the later 39 articles of religion. During Mary's Roman Catholic reaction, the Cambridge men lost their church positions but discovered a leadership of another kind, that of martyrdom. Together, Henry and Mary burned 25 Cambridge men for heresy. When Elizabeth came to the throne, she chose bishops for the church who had studied with the Cambridge reformers and who shared a conviction about the compatibility of tradition and reform. It was this reformed Christianity that colonists brought with them to Roanoke and Jamestown. The Religious Character of the Virginia Colony Under Elizabeth and James During the years that Elizabeth I and James I occupied the throne, the primary focus of English colonial efforts was Virginia. The records of that effort bear out the central role that religion played in their lives. The Virginia Martial Law Provisions of 1610, for example, specified that members of the colony should gather to give thanks and seek God's assistance at daily morning and evening prayer, Sunday morning worship, and Sunday afternoon instruction in the catechism. Clergy were to preside at daily worship and preach each Sunday and Wednesday. The colonists believed that their day-to-day -day struggle to found a settlement was re religiously significant for two important reasons. First, they could preach the gospel to an Indian population that had not yet heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Thus, Governor John White's account of the Roanoke's colony, which English clergyman and geographer Richard Hocklet, about 1552 to 1616, included in Principal Navigations, 1589, Recorded, recorded with pride the baptism of Monteo, the first Native American baptized by an Anglican. Jamestown colonist John Rolfe, 1585-1622, explained that his marriage to the Indian maiden Pocahontas, about 1595-1617, was, for the unbelieving creature, was converting to the true knowledge of God and Jesus Christ an unbelieving creature. The first Virginia legislature, 1619, declared its commitment to the conversion of the savages. A second motive for colonization was closely related. 
By spreading the gospel, colonists helped to unfold God's plan for the world, thereby hastening the coming of the kingdom. In a November 1622 sermon to the members of the Virginia Company, the new name adopted by the London Company in 1609, poet and Anglican clergyman John Donne, 1573-1631, used the Acts chapter 1, verse 8, promise that the Holy Spirit would assist the disciples to preach to the end of the earth to make the point. He noted that the members of his congregation had an advantage over the first century Christians, who knew nothing about such places as the West Indies and therefore could not reach the ends of the earth. Colonists of the Virginia Company could, in contrast, create a bridge to that world that shall never grow old, the kingdom of God. By adding the names of new colonists, the members of the company could add names to the Book of Life. Such prospects attracted serious-minded young clergy. Indeed, at the time when university education was still the exception rather than the rule among ordained Anglicans, most of those who volunteered for service in Virginia were university graduates. Alumni of Magdalen College, Oxford, and King's Emmanuel and St. John, John's Cambridge were well represented in the roles of colonial clergy. Robert Hunt, died 1608, the first vicar of Jamestown, had, for example, earned his M.A. from Magdalen College. The managers of the Virginia Company screened such volunteers and sent out the most qualified to fill newly established parishes and vacancies created by the high mortality rate in the colony. Forty-four of the 67 clergy who served before 1660 died within five years of arrival. When the members of the company appointed clergy for their colonies, they were following the English custom of patronage. In England, the individual or institution that built a church building and provided the support for its clergy had the right, the advowson, to present a candidate for rector or vicar to the bishop for his consent. Since the Virginia Company created parishes in each of its settlements, set aside glebe lands to provide income, and directed that glebe houses and churches be built, it also claimed the right to nominate the candidates to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Colonization under Charles I and during the Commonwealth For so long as James I occupied the throne, the majority of English colonists came to Virginia. With his death, however, the situation began to change rapidly the number of the religious variety of the colonies increased. The uniform religious character of the Jacobean colonies, broken only by the small and relatively late Plymouth settlement, gave way to a broad religious spectrum. While most English Christians during Charles's reign agreed that a reformed insistence on justification by faith was compatible with a national church, they disagreed strongly on what a properly reformed national church should look like. In particular, they could not agree on the externals of worship or on the role of the laity in church government. One party in Caroline, England, which the English at mid-century, which the English at mid-century would call Episcopal because of its support for the episcopacy, believed that the process of reform had already gone far enough. If anything, men, members of this party argued Anglicans had already abandoned too much of the medieval tradition. The English Book of Common Prayer and such attempts at Christian education as the homilies had corrected major theological abuses. The reforming legislation of the 16th century had ended the excessive concentration of power in the hands of the clergy and had given the laity its sufficient voice in church government through the Parliament. Members of a second church party, whom the English called Puritans, disagreed. They hoped further to purify Anglican worship by eliminating Catholic elements such as liturgical vestments, which they feared might obscure the changes that had taken place in theology. They also believed that the laity and the lower clergy needed a stronger voice in the church. Unlike Elizabeth I and James I, who had avoided identification with any single faction within the church, Charles I sided squarely with the Episcopal party. He appointed priests with Episcopal Episcopal party sympathies as his bishops, and supported a campaign by William Laud, 1573 to 1645, his choice for Archbishop of Canterbury, to reintroduce more Catholic ritual in England. Puritans objected, and Charles and Laud used arrest and corporal punishment to force compliance. 
1637, Charles and Laud intensified the religious campaign in two important ways. First, Charles invited a papal legate to join the royal court in order to minister to his queen, Roman Catholic Henrietta Maria of France, thereby signaling to the nation his intention to modify the anti-Roman Catholic stance of his two predecessors. Second, he required the use of the addition of the Book of Common Prayer in Scotland, of which he, like all British monarchs after 1603, was also monarch. The religious policy of the king and prelate solidified Puritan opposition. Most Puritans came to favor parliamentary, parliamentary authority over that of the king and to favor forms of church government in which primary authority was exercised by either regional gatherings of clergy and laity, Presbyterianism, or congregational meetings, Congregationalism, to, governments, to government by bishops. The colonists in Virginia were not particularly concerned with many of the issues that were hotly debated in Charles's England. Colonial life was still too rough and tumble, for example, for ecclesi ecclesiastical vestments to be a real option. Similarly, the role of bishops was more of a theoretical than a practical question, since no English bishop visited the colonies during the whole of the colonial period. Yet even so, the English debate during the years of Charles's reign had a profound effect on the religious character of the colonies. It provided so great a distraction from the effort of colonization that settlers were able to remake religious institutions to fit their circumstances. It also changed the character of emigration. In 1624, Charles prevailed upon his father, the then failing James I, to revoke the charter of the Virginia Company. Charles explained the action by referring to the high mortality rates and dissatisfaction among colonists in Virginia, but his major motive was political. He wanted a source of income that would be free of the control of a parliament that was becoming increasingly critical of his policies. Charles's actions in the remainder of the decade made this motivation clear. He did not suggest major reforms in the management of the Virginia colony, and generally paid less attention to it than had the officers of the Virginia Company. He allowed, for example, the Virginia Company's clergy placement system to lapse without providing for any alternative procedure. When he did summon the colonist legislature in 1629, it was only to demand tax concessions. The colonial legislatures rejected the tax proposal, but took advantage of the session to adopt a plan for the designation of clergy. The members of the lower house of the legislature, the House of Burgess, claimed the right to present clergy to the colonial governor for induction into parish positions. In the 1630s and 1640s, the Burgesses would also provide legal regulations governing colonial vestries. The vestries were evolving institutions in, Eng in England at the time. For the 13th and 16th century, from the 13th to the 16th century, English Christians used the name vestry to refer to the regular meetings in which parishioners gathered to provide for the maintenance of the church property. The situation changed, however, in 1598, when the English Parliament passed a law making vestries responsible for the care of the poor, a function carried out by monastic institutions before the Re Reformation. English Christians quickly learned that congregational meetings were not the most efficient means to meet such obligations. They began to elect select vestries, composed of leading men in the parish, who provided for the poor between sessions of the congregational meeting. During the 17th century, the English vestries took on additional duties that, carried out, that are carried out today by country governments. They cared for roads and replaced the decaying manorial court system in certain judicial matters. English Puritans saw the evolving vestry as a vehicle by which laypersons might acquire greater authority. Members of the colonial vestries in Virginia shared that perception. Indeed, the indifference of the king and their distance from London made it possible for them to gain a concession the English vestries would be unable to secure. During the 1630s, Virginia vestries began to select their own rectors. By 1643, the legislature abandoned its claim to designate clergy and incorporated vestry appointment to its religious statutes. The Virginia precedent would not be followed by Anglicans and all of the remaining colonies, however. For example, when, for example, the English government established the Anglican Church in Maryland at the end of the century, it gave to the governor the authority to, authority to assign clergy. After the American Revolution, however, the Virginia practice became the general rule in the American church. 
Virginia vestries attempted to revise English vestry clergy relations in another way. English clergy, once introduced into their parishes, could only be dismissed by their bishops, and then only for grave offenses. In a similar way, Anglican clergy in the Virginia colony, once inducted into their parishes by the governor, had life tenure. Their vestries could not dismiss them. Colonial Angli Anglicans tried to get around the situation by neglecting to present their new rectors to the governor, offering their clergy a series of one-year contracts instead. In most cases, these contracts were renewed each year, producing the stable relationship between vestry and clergy. Where disputes did arise, however, non-presentation provided the vestry with an effective weapon. Again, not all the colonies would follow the Virginia practice of non-representation during the colonial era. But after the American Revolution, the Episcopal Church in the United States adopted a canon, 1804, that bore some resemblance to the de facto Virginia arrangement. It made it possible for vestries to dispute with their clergy to appeal their bishops for a termination of the rector's tenure in circumstances that would never have been allowed under English canon law. The second way in which Charles Charles's religious policy affected colonial religion was through emigration. In 1630, whole communities of members of the Church of England, who favored congregational polity, took advantage of a generous royal charter and moved to New England. Almost from its inception, this settlement was larger in population than Virginia. Indeed, the colonists soon moved beyond the Massachusetts Bay Territory into what later became the separate colonies of New Hampshire and Connecticut. Going beyond the innovations of the settlers in Virginia, they limited church membership to those who could give accounts of their con con conversion and abandoned use of the Book of Common Prayer. With king and bishops safely distant in London, they were in little danger of being contradicted. On the contrary, John Withrop, 1588-1649, and other members of the new colony hoped that their innovations would provide a model that would be followed back home. The religious policy of the growing New England colony this distance, distance it not only from the church in England, but also from the Virginia colony in the south. The two colonies, separated geographically by the Dutch colony of, the New, of New Netherlands, attracted colonists from different parts of England. Two-thirds of the New England colonists came from the eastern counties of England's East Anglia. The clergy in Virginia, whose geographical patterns usually matched those of the parishioners whom they served, came predominantly from the north and west of England. Differences that already existed in England were only amplified in America. Massachusetts Bay was not the only new colony chartered by Charles. Interested in the fortunes of Roman Catholics at the royal court, he also gave his Roman Catholic se secretary at, at state, George Calvert, about 1580 to 1632, permission to create a colony, Maryland, chartered in 1632. The first colonists sailed two years later. The majority of the wealthier em emigrants would be Roman Catholics, but for the start, they only constituted a minority of the settlers. Many of the lower-income colonists remained sympathetic with their Episcopal party in the Church of England. In the following decade, Charles was no longer in a position to authorize new colonization. He was locked in a losing power struggle with the Puritans that required all his attention. In 1640, Scottish Presbyterians, unhappy with the Scottish Book of Common Prayer, invaded England. Charles summoned two sessions of Parliament to raise money for an English army. But a Presbyterian majority in the House of Commons allied itself with the Scots against the King. The Presbyterians joined with the army of Oliver Cromwell, 1599-1658, composed primarily of Puritan independents, Congregationalists, to win the resultant civil war. The victors executed both Archbishop Laud, 1645, and Charles I, 1649. With the king and archbishop removed, the parliament reshaped the Church of England, abolishing the Book of Common Prayer, the Episcopate, and the 39 Articles of Religion. An assembly of Puritan divines, summoned by the parliament to meet at Westminster Abbey, drew up a new confession of faith and a directory of worship. The victory of the Presbyterian party was, however, only partial. Backed by Oliver Cromwell, independent Puritans were able to resist Parliament's efforts to bring all the English Puritanism under the new Presbyterian form of government, church, Presbyterian form of church government. 
1653, Cromwell asserted his authority over the Parliament more openly. He dissolved the legislative body and ruled alone as England's Lord Protector. He continued to rule until his death in 1658. English colonists in the New World acted in a predictable manner. New Englanders from the same East Anglican towns from the same East Anglian towns that were centers of Presbyterian and Congregational opposition to the crown, supported the Parliament. The colonists in Virginia, Maryland, and Bermuda, from areas of England in which Loyalist sentiments were strong, favored the royal family. A third group of colonists, dissenters who objected not only to the Episcopal, but also the Presbyterian and Congregational forms of discipline and doctrine, took advantage of the confusion in England to form a colony in Rhode Island, First Charter in 1644, and to establish a dissenting foothold in the Bahamas, arrival of dissenters from Bahama, from Bermuda in 1648. The Colonies After the Restoration Charles I's son, King Charles II, 1660 to 85, returned to England from exile on the continent in 1660 invited by a parliament that was dissatisfied with Richard Cromwell's attempt to succeed his father. With Charles II's restoration, the Episcopal party recaptured the parliament and ended the Church of England's experiment with Presbyterian government. Anxious to prevent any rep repetition of the Civil War, the Episcopal party in parliament not only reestablished the episcopacy, the prayer book, Book of Common Prayer, 1662, and the traditional 39 Articles of Religion, but also enacted legislation to guarantee continued dominance of the Church of England. The Parliament required, for example, that all clergy in the Church of England who were ordained during the Presbyterian years be reordained by bishops or forfeit their positions. It also strengthened the language in the prayer book's preface about the requirement that clergy read morning and evening prayer daily. Many Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Independents Particular among the clergy, particularly among the clergy, refused to accept the Parliament's terms. Approximately 300,000 laypersons and one-fifth of the clergy withdrew from the Church of England and formed separate dissenting denominations. The Parliament tolerated the new groups, but adopted the Clarendon Code to limit their privileges. The Code's Five Mile Act, for example, forbade dissenting ministers from living within five miles of any town or parish in which they had served. The strategy led to a rapid decline in the number of dissenters in England. There were only 50,000 left in 1750. It provided, however, an increased motivation for dissenting emigration to the colonies, where the provisions of the Clarendon Code were not systematically enforced. The Puritans in Massachusetts, for example, retained rights and privileges under their royal charter, despite the fact they organized as a denomination, the Congregational Church, outside of the Church of England. Charles I, moreover, granted a new royal charter to Congregationalists in the Connecticut Valley, 1662. Sorry, Charles II, moreover, granted a new royal charter to Congregationalists in the Con Connecticut Valley, 1662. The Church of England, a majority party at home, was soon outnumbered more than three to one by dissenters in the colonies. Only in Virginia, Bermuda, and a few British possessions in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Barbados, Antigua, etc., did colonists remain within the church, and even they were slow to enforce Parliament's new religious legislation. As of 1686, a Virginia vestry, for example, elected a rector who had not complied with the requirement for Episcopal ordination. The Restoration did not, however, finally settle the religious debate in England. The Parliament was strongly Episcopal in sentiment, but both Charles II and his brother, King James II, 1685-88, were deeply attracted to Roman Catholicism. Charles II made a deathbed profession to Rome, and James, was fo James, followed as an open Roman James followed an open Roman Catholic policy. When James II introduced Roman Catholic worship at the universities, put Roman Catholics at the head of the army, and arrested seven Anglican bishops, the Parliament ejected him from the throne. Charles and James pursued their religious goals in a way that contributed to the growth of Presbyterian, Congregational, and other dissenting groups in the colonies. Believing that granting toleration to dissenting Protestants in the colonies was the first step toward toleration of Roman Catholics, 
Charles renewed the Charter of Baptists in Rhode Island, 1663, and granted a charter to Quaker William Penn for Pennsylvania, 1681. In addition, he made no provisions for the establishment of the Church of England in the new charters of the Carolinas, 1663, or the territory in New Jersey and New York, 1664, that the English had taken from the Dutch. In the year before he was removed from the throne, James attempted to follow his brother's colonial policy with a declaration of indulgence, which would have removed legal penalties against dissenting Protestants and Roman Catholics in England itself. During Charles II's reign, Presbyterians emigrated in increasing numbers to New York and New Jersey. Where neither the Congregational nor Anglican Church was established, and where the Dutch Calvinists, who predated the English, represented a theological tradition similar to their own. By the next century, English, Scottish, and Irish Presbyterians would prove as numerous as the, in the British colonies on the American mainland as the Anglicans. By the time that James II abandoned, abandoned the English throne in 1688, the American colonies were well on their way to becoming the most denominationally diverse territory on earth. Anglicans, Congregationalists, Roman Catholics, Presbyterians, Baptists, and Quakers all had their spheres of influence. The colonists had lost, had, had lost forever the religious simplicity of the first colonies in Virginia and Bermuda. The Divided Church and the Failure of Moral Vision The religious disagreements that colonists brought with them from England contributed to the zeal and excitement of the competing religious enclaves. The same disagreements, however, resulted in both an intolerant attitude toward others and a lack of moral vision. In one sense, the colonists were simply mimicking the actions of the British toward them. When the English authorities paid attention to the religious life of this diverse group of colonists, it was most often for negative reasons. In 1638, Archbishop Laud proposed sending a colonial bishop, not to Virginia or Bermuda, where Episcopal sympathies were strong, but to New England, where such a bishop might be used to replace congregational polity. Oliver Cromwell would likewise send a delegation with military authority, not to friendly territory, but to, but to Royalist Virginia, in order to convince the colonists there to abandon the Book of Common Prayer with its petitions for the king and the royal family. The colonists' record was hardly better than that of their motherland. In 1643, Virginia's legislature banned all who were not members of the Episcopal party from the colony. Groups of Maryland Protestants led armed insurrections against the Roman Catholic gentry, 1655-58, and 1689. Massachusetts authorities executed four Quakers for heresy, 1659-61, and 19 residents of Salem for witchcraft, 1692. The various groups of colonists had won for themselves the control of their own religious lives, but they were unwilling to grant the same privilege to minorities within their midst. The English disagreements about religion also diverted energy that could have been directed to shaping the moral character of the colonies. The preoccupation with congregational orthodoxy in New England, the lack of a resident episcopacy in Virginia, the minority position of the Roman Catholic gentry in, Eng in Maryland, and the general fragmentation of the colonies into small religious groupings made any united church response on moral issues impossible. In particular, the colonists were not in a strong position to respond to the decaying relationships with the Indians and the advancement of slavery. Dutch traders brought the first slaves to America in 1619. The institution of slavery did not have the same strong negative connotations to the 17th century English that it has today. Peasants were bound to the land in parts of Europe into the 19th century. Arab slave traders were active in Africa and the Spanish had already pioneered the use of slaves in the Americas in their colonies. The number of slaves was relatively small. There were only 16,000 in 1690. But the decisions made in the 17th century laid the groundwork for the much larger institution of the following two centuries. There was little legal pre precedent for the establishment of racial slavery. It would, not, it would not be until 1662, in the confusing early years of the restoration of Charles II, that the Virginia House of Burgess put slavery on a firmer legal footing, setting aside the English precedent 
that the status of a child dependent on that of the father. For black slaves, the status of the child would thereafter depend on that of the mother. This action would be followed in other colonies. The clergyman Morgan Godwin's Negroes and Indians Advocate, 1680, protested the treatment of colonial slaves and that of the Virginia legislature, and that the Virginia legislature found it necessary in 1605, 1705 to enact a fine of 10,000 pounds of, to- of tobacco for any clergyman who married a black to a white suggests some opposition from clergy to the establishment of slavery. But with the colonists divided into competing religious groups, and with only limited support from England, little could be done. The situation was similar in regards to the evangelization and treatment of the Indians. In the years from 1625 to 1688, in which James I's son and grandsons occupied the English throne, some colonists did, did follow the example of such early colonists as Thomas Harriet, who had preached to the Indians at Roanoke, and Alexander Whitaker, who had prepared Pocahontas for baptism. Such colonists met with an almost insurmountable problem, however. They had the greatest success among small coastal tribes that saw the English settlers as potential allies against the tribes in the interior. Yet it was precisely the coastal tribes that were being displaced by incoming colonists. Those engaged in serious work among the Indians were isolated from the general population and lacked the political clout to change settlement patterns. When the inevitable hostilities with the Indians developed, such as Virginia's Great Massacre, 1622, colonial authorities adapted the use of military force to move the Native Americans further west. The divided colonial churches could not speak with a united voice on behalf of Native or Black Americans.